Please note, the following podcast contains adult language and sexuality and is suitable only for adult listeners. Electric acid. I mean, do these little girls understand even how they got pregnant? No. Do they no, even they understand where the... what? I can't imagine being eight years old having any concept of what any of that is happening. They don't. Either. I'm your host, Yvette Lopez. I'm a former Playboy Maxim and FHM model. Currently, I'm a singer, compassionate healer, and an entrepreneur in wellness and fashion. Welcome to our show. Hi, I'm Yvette Lopez, and you're listening to Bodacious Minds. Today's guest host is Stephanie Baklaan. She's a really good friend of mine for about 20 years. Hi, Steph. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. I'm good. It's good to see you, honey. I'm just seeing you in person. Oh my god! I know. I'm going to reach through the phone and grab you. (laughs) How are you? I'm good, babe. It's been a very interesting time. We haven't talked in a minute, so there's been lots of stuff, lots of good, lots of good, and some bad. You know, uh, the few breakdowns along the way. How have you been through all this COVID crap? Oh God, I don't know. It's, I, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster, you know, I, as strong as I am and, oh, I can do this. And I love being home. I have my, my breakdowns of, I miss my friends. I miss my family. I miss going to work. Kinda, kinda, kinda. But I mean, like my livelihood, you know, has been canceled all over the news. So it's interesting to try to figure out what I'm going to do, you know, what, where my purpose is or something. So so it's awesome that you're having me on the show and to be part of <laughs> Bodacious Minds. I'm very excited about this. We have an amazing guest today. I won't say her name quite yet, but she has a lot to talk about. Not only is she beautiful, she was a playmate in 2000 and she gives back in a way that is very special. And I wanted to have her on to really talk about these things. And I, 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 we chose you as our guest host because I thought that it would be a, a really good fit to get all of us girls to to talk about these things that we're going to talk about in hopes <laughs> to really bring awareness and and allow people to know. And, and I say this to women, you know, I, I don't like to just focus just on women, but I say this to women that it's okay to have gone through something hard and to know that there's always going to be that rainbow at the end of the tunnel. And this woman that's coming on, she is going to share her stories and show you that there is good that comes out of bad. And I think once we all get in the, in, in the flow of our conversations that we'll open up about our own personal stuff. And hopefully this will bring, um, shine some light on on some subjects that people uh, hide, hide from, the experiences that people hide from. So let's bring her on. She's an author. She's a writer. She's a model. She's an activist. She has an amazing life story. She was born in the U.S., raised in Peru, which I think is fucking amazing. I just got back from Peru, and Peru is one of the most amazing places in the world. She returned to the United States at the age of 15, And her and her sister actually uh, returned to the U.S. at the age of 15 and worked at McDonald's to support themselves. So let's bring her on. Her name is Darlene Barnaola. How do you say it, Stephanie? (laughs) Barnaola. Barnaola. And if I said that wrong, please forgive me, but we'll have her correct us when she's on. Uh, Please welcome Darlene. Aloha. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm excited. Hi. You know, there's so many things that you do that I look up to. I this this is a path that I want to enter and that, that I look forward to having in my life with Thank things you. that you're doing. Darlene, you know, I wanted to start off with obviously Playboy, because I was in Playboy. (laughs) And so (laughs) big fan of yours. Uh, Uh, Thank you. Darlene has a twin sister. And uh, I wanted to ask, like, how did you guys get involved in Playboy? Well, I honestly, I hate everything about modeling and attention. But my sister used to be like in Ford modeling agency. So she was doing modeling and stuff like that. And her ex-husband owned a nightclub, one of the biggest nightclubs in Miami Beach. So when the Playboy was doing the search for the Millennium Playmate, they were doing a search all over the world and every city in, in, in the United States. And Miami was the last city. 
there was a huge party and it happened that the party was the final closing of the search was in, in Miami, my sister's nightclub. So that's when um, somebody went up to her and said, hey, why didn't you do the tryout? And my sister was like, I'm not going to make a line with 300 women. And I'm not, I'm not doing that. No, no. And then the, this guy was like, well, what if I give you a one on one with the senior editor of Playboy that at the time was Marilyn Goralski? So um, she was like, all right. And she went. And when she saw my sister, she's like, oh, I'm going to make you rich and famous. And then wow. she's like, oh, by the way, I have a twin sister. And that's how it started. <laughs> how lucky are you to do that and have that experience with your sister? You know, I always said if I had a twin, I'd be a fucking millionaire. I know what I would If you had done. a twin, you would hate it. You would <laughs> hate every single aspect of it. Let really? Me tell you. <laughs> what, it, what, what do you hate about it most? Well, it's just people assume that we're one person and we're black and white. It's completely opposite. And then uh, people assume that if you do one thing, the other one has to do it. And I'm an individual. I'm not a twin. I'm a human being. I'm a person. So for me, I don't like when people group you up into somebody. You or get the package. Or, right? Yeah, I'm like, you yeah, get yeah, the exactly. package like, deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, nah. I'm like, I'm on my own. <laughs> what was it like? But it was like- a great opportunity. But it was a really yeah. great opportunity. So yes, yeah, and I'm very grateful. I'm sure all the yeah. experiences you had, right? Uh, well, I'll tell you what I loved about it. I love the fact that, you know, that it brought confidence to me that somebody believed in me. I mean, I wish it was for like what the inside of me, not what I look in the outside, because I think that's more important as a person. But OK, so they looked at the outside. And it was a beautiful thing. I mean, I, I got to meet wonderful people, the experience about parties and nightclubs and the all that stuff I don't like had you guys never crossed paths during no but she but like Vela does look familiar you know um and, and don't think like I'm very grateful with Playboy and the opportunities I mean look I'm I'm here with you guys so it's obviously open great doors for me I just I don't like to be labeled thing because again I'm an individual I don't want to be labeled as a playmate because yeah I did that but that's not who I am that's just a label so I don't I'm not good in labels so my husband says the same thing to me all the time you know what he says it's funny he's like you know that was something you did it's not who you are because that's something exactly. that I had I had trouble like I didn't know how to identify myself and and coming yeah. from a, uh, you know being uh, an abused child you're always looking for places to put yourself and ways to explain yourself I guess does that even make sense yeah trying to find who I was so it was like oh I did playboy so then playboy became who I was. But the funny thing about it is I always know who I was. I knew who I am and what I'm about. So when somebody would put a label to me, I was like, no, that's not what I am. That's not who I am. That's not, again, I don't want to sound like I'm grateful, but I mean, not for anything. Have you seen the playmates that fucking still want to hang on to their title of like I know 1960? You. I'm like, dude, well, this is my question. Old. And maybe for <laughs> listeners, we can kind of differentiate I don't know the difference. Like if you're a playmate, is this a lifetime job? Um, you guys well, were playmates in January of 2000, right? Was that the centerfold? Is that like, well, yes. A playmate is the one who shows up in the centerfold. And uh, so they, I, I kind of like learn how to understand like, that because everybody right. apparently was a playmate who okay. was in the mag. Everybody's a playmate. Everybody's this, but I, I learned to identify that. If you are in, you come out in the United States, in the magazine in the United States, not international, not anywhere, and you are in the centerfold, you are a playmate. Playboy used to have a bunch of different magazines and the college thing and the, I don't know, a bunch of crap. So, but those are, the girls will pose and stuff, but they're not considered playmates. They just consider playmate models. Some crap like that. I was in seven issues of the, I did the all Latin Playboy there were newsstand mm-hmm. specials is what we called them. I did seven of those issues. And that was my thing with Playboy. And then I worked with Latin America Playboy. It's a, it's, a, but Latin America Playboy also calls everybody differently. Yeah. Well, I was a spokesperson for Playboy <laughs> Latin, Latin America for many years. So I would travel to all in America. And then a bunch of the girls would be like, oh, I'm a playmate because they would do an interview or something like that. I'm like, all right. You know, it's like, yeah, but I'm, I'm like, all right, dude. Like, more power yeah, to but you were also, you, you were playmate of the year. I'm the millennium playmate. Marilyn Monroe was the first playmate of the first millennium 
and we are the first payment of the second one. So it's like pretty much that's the only title there, kind of similar. How how long do you have to hold the title for? Like, what is I your job left after? The title long time oh, after ago. you're done shooting, you're you're like free to go. I mean, they always, <laughs> I mean, I worked for many years again right. with Lewin, and I'm very grateful for them. It's pretty much whenever you don't want to work, you know, like if whenever if they call you, say, oh, you want to do an appearance, you want to go travel, you want to do this, you just keep on saying yes until you say no. It's so. pretty amazing, though. You're beautiful. And it's, I looked at some of your pictures and you it amazing. At which point did you decide that you wanted to stop? Well, the thing is, uh, is um, when uh, I'm going to go into like not politics, but kind of politics, like back <laughs> in the when it was the election, I remember that uh, now I have been known in my country for a writer. I do a bunch of stuff in Peru. Peru is also my, I consider it my country. And I did a bunch of other stuff. And then when the elections came out, obviously Playboy came out with, um, they put my picture, my, my picture, and they said that Trump was everywhere in the press. Trump did a porn and was my picture in it because in the millennium search, whatever, one of the stops was New York and he went to a party and took pictures uh, with uh, like the, some playmates or some models and whatever. So because he was in the search for them, uh, like in that small piece of video or whatever, they said that Trump is a porn. But my freaking picture was in front of everything. So now the, what this happened is that I never tell. I mean, when I moved like 10 years to car, I never tell that I was a plane. Or, I really don't because I don't it doesn't again, it doesn't define me. And then next thing you know, my face is in every new like in everywhere, CNN and stuff like that. And my daughter. So it affected my daughter. And for me, it's one thing that I want to keep my stuff private and whatever. But when she starts being making fun of in school and ask, and people are telling her, is it true your mom made a porn with Trump? So it's not that I was ashamed when I explained to my daughter. It's like, listen, what I did, I'm, it was nice. It was tasteful. It's not like I'm like this with my legs open, you know, or whatever. But it was a nude, granted, but it's not for, it wasn't. I didn't do a porn, you know, my daughter has always been very proud of me, but I, I felt how it affected her. So, you know, that's why I'm like, yeah, well, from this, though, it led you to some amazing things. And I think that they, maybe that was the platform for you to at least uh, be open about certain things that have happened to you in your life. Right. And being able to well, go in and travel and help other women. Young women. Well, I think that it's me that I made that happen, not what I did. You know, I think that I don't I mean. It's not like a, a company told me go to help little girls who's been raped. I did that. Nobody, you know, I mean, I mean even if I wasn't famous, I still would have went and knocked on the door and done the same thing. You know, so this is something that you got. So I guess we should talk about it because our listeners don't know what we're talking about. Darlene, can you tell us a little bit about what you do in Peru and with the women that you work with and, 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 and kind of lead us into that um, into that story? Well, I was introduced to, um, uh, you know, I was uh, raped from lessons since I was six years old. A lot of people who go through what I do, some of them actually confront it and deal with it as a child or whatever. And some of them wait many years to actually to come out. We actually suppress that. Well, you they know, kill themselves. So, well, yeah, um, some people do want to kill themselves, but it's some, it changes who you are. So it mm -hmm. changes who you could have been, put it that way, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's a battle. And when I came out and I started talking about it, I wanted somebody to pay for wh wh what they did to me. So what I did was I was able to get a hold of the person who did this to me. Well, he actually contacted me. And then um, what I pretty much did was I told them, you know, I, I confront him. I recorded him. And I tried to act like I didn't remember and it was my stepfather. And when I had the recording, I'm like, ah, I call my attorney. He's like, OK, can I do something? Can we send it to jail? But even if he didn't admit it, but he kind of did like remember some things. But it's like and they told me, no, I can't do anything about it. So I went on Facebook. It's one of kind of like, you know, it was a good thing and a bad thing because I shouldn't have put my business out there. Should have handled it myself. But at the end of the day, it kind of ended up turning into something good. So I pretty much, you know, outed it out, you know, and I talked about it. And next thing that you know, it's like 
and Peru was like every newspaper, everything was one. I'm like, oh my God, what the fuck did I just do? Wow. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. I'm like, I didn't think anybody would watch it or see it, but I was just, I guess I, I wanted everybody to know who he was. So then I found out that I can't say his name and blah, blah, blah. So then um, when I was doing a bunch of, I, I felt an obligation that I had to do interviews and I had to talk about it. And when I did, a friend of mine who was a reporter told me about this place in Peru, Centro de Adolescentes de Villa Maria del Triunfo. And um, in Peru, there's no abortion. So these little girls are forced, literally forced to have these children at a mm -hmm. rate. And we're talking about eight-year-old eight year old girls, 10. So you're seeing these angels with a big belly. What I did is I started telling every newspaper or everybody, it's like, I'll give you an interview, but you need to donate. You need to help. You need to donate. You need to give something. I'll give you. I said, I never, I never been like, oh, I have to pay me or anything like that. But no, you need to donate. You want to answer? No problem. Donate. So I started getting very involved with this organization. And, and it was just very touching how, how, how little girls have to deal with it. Listen, I've been blessed. I, I lived a lot of things and I was that little girl, but I wasn't pregnant. But you anymore. said eight years old. I mean, do these little girls understand even how they got no. pregnant? Do they no, even they understand where the, what, I can't imagine being eight years old, having any concept of what any of that is happening. They don't, either. they don't understand their body. They don't get it. One of the things that when I would go and sit down with them and I made events and I would donate my own money and I would do, I would try to help as much as I could. And then when I would go there, I would like sit down and talk to the girls and try to tell them that, listen, this is not going to, this is not doesn't define you. Don't let them win. And um, the one thing they will ask me, that's how you could understand the innocence of each child, this, this little girls. One thing that they will ask me was, does the marks, the lines in your bodies go away? So they were thinking about their stretch marks. And it broke my heart because I realized how innocent these children, they were not asking uh, how the baby's going to come out. They don't care about the baby because why should they? They're children. They do, children having children, they don't get what's going on. They don't love their stomach because it wasn't planned. You know what I mean? Like a mother has a kid and when you're pregnant, you love the baby. They don't know any better, you know? No. So what they do is like they ask me if my stretch marks go away. And then I show them, I pull my pants down the stretch marks. I have my guy like this. I'm like, hey, I said, don't be ashamed of that. That's like a tiger. You know, you have stripes like a tiger and the tiger's gorgeous, beautiful. Don't be ashamed of it. And it's okay, you know, but what else can you tell a little girl, you know? Let me go back to, actually, let me rewind back to you mm -hmm. as a little girl, though. When mm -hmm. did this all ha start happening to you? Six. And then when? Six. And for mm -hmm. how long? Unfortunately, it was different people. And in different times of my life as a child. So it's not like it was like one person consecutively. It was just like, it was, it actually, it was like, I want to say like three, four people. So you were six, so you can, you can relate because they're eight. They don't really know what's going on. You mm -hmm. get the gist of it. Kind of. I mean, I well, <laughs> the thing, the interesting thing about it is that you don't get it. And even if I can't say, oh, I know what it feels like because. I don't. It's a completely different thing speaking to a child who's pregnant because for me, it happened and in a way, as an adult, you can understand the sexual aspect of it. You know, this you can understand that. But having a kid of six year old, I, yeah, I can yeah. never even say I know what it feels like. I can't because I don't know what it felt like. When did you girls cut periods at eight years old? Jesus, that's like, I, this is like whoa. shocking to me. Well, there is a record. I want to say it was five years old. There's a record wow. or six years old. It, it in, actually was in Peru, the youngest female who was ever pregnant. Wow, that world. is awful. I mean, that yeah. could kill her. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, at, what forget, age, listen. at what age did you come out of your shell? Did this stop and you're like, this is when you started your journey? I mean, you, did it ever affect you relationships? You were well, engaged? I never thought. Mm -hmm. Well, I never thought, my husband always used to tell me, it's like, oh, you have no, idea. and this is before I accepted it because you block it, you internalize it, you actually don't want to talk about it. You kind of be like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm just dreamt about it. Maybe I just didn't, maybe it's not true. Maybe I'm just creating shit in my head and stuff like that. But my husband always just tell me, it's like, you are, 
you'll be surprised how much your past has really affected you have no idea about and that yeah, me, yeah. the person that i am i'm like are you fucking crazy i'm strong nothing affects me and you create this hard shell trying to say no because again as me as a person i feel like i don't want to give them credit like no, you're not going to mark me. Maybe you did, but you won't mark me. You won't make me a victim because I hate that word. I mean, also, yeah. Yvette, I mean, you've had trauma in your younger years, too. I mean, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's I was how I was in seventh grade when my tra- when something like that happened. It was a family member. And um, and I know what it did. I know what it still does to me. It was something that I blocked out for years and then now just a few years ago, I remember. And it was like, whoa. You know, I, I being Latin, you were raised to be very loyal and you don't ever speak about your family negatively. You don't speak outside of the family. Everything is hush hush. And so not being able to talk about it and when, and, and people don't believe you half the time. So, you know, you just figure you something you got to live with. So, you know, it's, it's tough. It's as a woman, Growing up with abuse and 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 it did fuck up my relationships because I stayed in abusive relationships because it seemed to be the easiest way to to be because it's what I knew. So you know it's really sad to hear these stories about these young girls. You know especially in other countries because there's here we have more freedom, more outlets, yeah. and, and and we have a law that protects us. Sometimes, most of the time, uh, not so really. You know, if you think about it's, it, it's, it's sad to hear. You know, so well, you know. This, I think it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing that you're out there for these women and, 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 you know, everybody, we need, we need more of that. We need more um, people like you to use our voices to help other people, especially these young women that, um, that don't have their voice. I mean, I don't know. It's a, it's a really soft spot for me. I particularly, um, something I never talk about, but when I researched and got invited to do this show, Um, I related to you tremendously because of things that you were saying and like, not even for young women, but let's even say for older women that have never talked about it. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll say, for example, I've been through things when I was little and never, ever, ever talked about it. So it's, I, I, I ask these questions because I'm kind of learning. Right. And I hope other people are learning too, because as old as I am, never talked about it, just continue living life. I really don't want to talk about it. You know, I really don't. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm okay. I feel like, yeah. but you guys have, but you know, Stephanie, that you're really not okay. <laughs> you know that. I mean, and that's what, and because I would, I used to say the same thing. I'm okay. And then I didn't realize how fucked up I truly was. And because again, like, like I was saying before, you try to be strong and no, you're not going to beat me. But the truth is, it does fuck affect you. It does really change your life. It changes who the person that you're supposed to be. And then it's extra job as a human being when somebody does something like that to you to actually change it, you know, to actually yeah. be like the fight to make that no, you're not going to win is a lot harder. I, for me, I think it was a lot harder than actually the event that caused me to be there. Yes, that's I how know. I want to know. Well, I want to say something. I want to say, you know, I have to disagree. I have to say all the things that happened to me in my life. Yeah, they not all the things, but a lot of things that my, my childhood uh, were fucked up, but it made me stronger. It really did. And because of what they did to me, pushed me to do better and be better and be successful and I could have ended up a drug addict, a, a this, a that. And I chose not to do that. You know, when I, I, I think that there, there are ways to, to turn this into a positive. And I know that I did it for myself. Yeah, I still live with the, the burden of these things. But I do things to love myself and help myself and get myself through, um, through those times. And, and, all, and I use my, my voice and my knowledge to help others. Um, you know, and, and I feel like that's my way of healing even more. I agree with you. It's just that I don't want to give them credit for them fucking up my life. I agree with you. It's like, no, you could overcome anything. You could become strong. I just don't want to give them credit that it did affect me. You know, like I don't want to make them happy. That person that is looking at you and 
some th- people are evil. And right now, even with the worst time of our life, the humanity is garbage. Nobody is compassionate. Nobody is lovable. Nobody. Well, I'm compassionate. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, well, if you look at the news. We don't want to get into the politics right now, but we uh, the sex trafficking, the child trafficking. Oh, did you the 10 page long list of congressmen, actors, directors of people involved in child pornography? I, I feel like. The majority of the world has had trauma, has had molestation mm-hmm. and rape. And mm-hmm. here, us three, it does not define us, right? But the rest of the world, like, people are like, well, there's trauma. We need to overcome it. I mean, that's where I think that our strength is, is that we were able to live with it. And then there's exactly. these people that literally, well, that literally are carrying it over from generation to generation. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk, you know, let's, I, I, I have yet to read your book and I can't wait to read your book. And I, I, <laughs> I apologize for that, but, um, and symbolo, and that means the symbol, correct? Uh-huh. It's a yes. Symbol. And it's a symbol of what, what is the, the meaning of it? Okay. So in my book, right. It, it the originally in English is, um, the token. So because in the part of the book, there's a there is, you know, there is a, a meaning for a token, you know, I, I, I actually it's funny because I forgot whatever in the book. <laughs> it is actually, <laughs> but there is, I know that there was like a part in the book that is, uh, it, it meant something, a, a symbol, you know, a, a token it was very significant in the book. So I translate it to a symbol. So a symbol is like something that is, you know, a symbolic, you know, that means mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Can you do, you know, give us a little information yeah, on it started, or what, what is it for? Yeah. Well, when I started writing it, it was that time when I first started coming and understanding my past and it was a very rough time. So it was, I still ashamed because I was ashamed. I was embarrassed for anybody to find out that what happened to me. But again, that fury that I want I want everybody to know who this person is, or I want everybody to understand, like, you know, like I want somebody to pay for what they've done. I wanted justice because there's no justice. Most of the time there's no justice. But at the same time, like I said, I was ashamed of what happened to me. So I kind of based it on me and I didn't say anything to anyone, but it was a novel, you know? And then years later is when I kind of finally actually said, actually, that's me, you know? <laughs> like the character and the thing, that's me, that things had to happen to me. I creatively made it in the story, yet it's my story, but I changed it something to it. So yeah, it's kind of like an autobiographer novel type of thing. So it's about your experience of- of Everything. Everything. Life. Mm-hmm. Life. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Well, but it's a three series book. I just haven't wrote the other parts yet. I have a deal for three books and I just wrote one and I just been, you know, I just haven't done the other two books. And do you have it in an English transcript or is it in Spanish only? It's in Spanish, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was published in Peru. Yeah. Okay. In okay. South America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Darling, yeah, you worked amazing. at McDonald's too. Yes, ma'am. Right? What was, my first was that job. fun? I mean... Not really, because I didn't know how to speak English and I faked, I bullshitted my way into working, you know, it's like they put me, I was 16, no, 15 years old. And that was the only job I was able to find. And thank God the guy was a Latin, the manager was Latin. So I was able to speak Spanish. And then by the time I was like, oh, fuck, how am I going to eat English? So I would just be in the direct field. I'm like, okay, uh huh. And number one, perfect. Number one, you know, like, you know, I didn't have to have that much communication but yeah it did work there. I mean fun I don't know about fun it's more it's a lot of work when you can't speak the language but you know you were born in the U.S. raised in Peru and then came back with your twin sister uh yes at 15 years old mm-hmm. Got did it. your sister okay. work there also yes she did work oh you there. both work there okay yes we both did work there yeah and how long did that how what was then what happened I was working three jobs at the same time because I was 15 by myself and I had to, I had to survive. So I worked there, Beth, Bad and Beyond and uh, IHOP. So I had three jobs. Where were your parents still in Peru? I pretty much was raised by myself. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I okay. was pretty what, much on my What made own. you choose to come back to the U.S.? What made you decide? I wanted a better life. Unfortunately, I didn't have an education. So I never even, I don't even have an elementary education. 
So for me, I remember exactly the moment I wanted better. I was in the jungle because of my family is from Villa Rica. And, um, and I, I was freaking, they would throw me one here, one, three months there, six months there. So I was like a hippie, whoever would take me into their home. And I remember being in my, one of my uncle's house in the jungle. And, you know, I had like a bunch of my cousins had, you know, had families and they were going to medical school. They were going to having an education. And I would look, it's like, man, why can I have that? And I remember sitting in the top of the mountain saying, I want more. I really want more. And I'm like, wait, but I'm an American, you know, and you hear as a little girl, like the American dream, you always hear in references and stuff like this, like, well, why can I do it? So then I started thinking, oh, maybe I'll join the army. You know, that literally was my test. Like, oh, if I joined the army, uh, I was doing, I, I found out that, you know, when you joined the army, you could get, you could go at 15 or 16 years old. And then you get a, you get a place to live. You have food and you could actually go to college. You know, I think that they pay you for college or something like that. So I was like, great, I want that. And I decided to do that. And I made it happen. You know, I had $300 in my pocket and I got to the United States. How'd you get to the United States? An airplane? Like that? That's the question? No. Yeah. yeah. As 15, you could just fly over the, without a passport or anything? Oh, I had, you know, I got a pass. I had a passport and stuff like that, but I just, we got in the plane and just left. No language, no nothing. And just say, fuck it. We're, my idea was getting out of the airport and going straight to a uh, army, re- army recruiting, whatever the hell right. they call that, army recruiting. And uh, then I did that. And when I realized that you need a uh, parent's permission, that you need, obviously you need to speak English. I didn't speak English. And I was like, oh, fuck, now what am I going to do? So I just started looking for a job and looking the way that we were going to survive. So, yeah. You, you did it. You did it. And look where you. you are now. Thank and you're happy and yeah. healthy. And you have a beautiful daughter. And Thank she's going you. to college yeah. now. And <laughs> yeah, second year, second year in college. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's every mother's dream, their child to become better than you. So, yes, I wanted her never to experience anything that I had to. And I was like, you know, I'm finally now dedicating my time for me and my career and, you know, writing my scripts because before I just couldn't do it. And even when I had like, I was doing it and I was like, oh my God, there was this time in the, in Peru that um I got, I got with this production company and they wanted one of my scripts and they're like, oh my God, you could be a part of it. We could do the production. I was like my dream come true. Yes, I could do it. But then that would have taken me away uh, a couple of months away from my daughter and my daughter had two years left before she went to college. And I'm like, I can't do that. I can. She didn't ask to be in this world. And I have to be a full-time mom dedicated because I, that's the decision. She, she needs me, you know? And until so she's not out on her own, I will not move a finger. First, always going to come her. So now I could be selfish and think about me. <laughs> <laughs> so I what do you, it. what do you go, what are you go getting into now? What is your uh, goals now? Um, I'm a screenwriter. Oh, it's my passion. That's what I love. For years, I've been working on it. And that's like, that is just something that I find that makes me, I'm a storyteller. I always, I always knew I was a storyteller, but I just never knew how I was going to do. Obviously, I didn't know how to write or read. So what the fuck was I was like, you know, <laughs> but, you know I'm like, but that's, that's me. That's who I, that's who I am. And if I have to name my, if I have to put a title, I'm a writer, you know, I'm a screenwriter. That's it. <laughs> I mean, and there's the beautiful silver lining from everything, all the trauma that we go through and, and yeah. it pulls out all of your strength. And that's, that's what we hope the world can do, right? Is pull out all their positivity and pull out, find the silver well, lining in all of this. Yeah. When you go to a difficult time, it's kind of like you want to, you know, I always used to wonder like, how the fuck everything happens to me? It's like, is that like a, Why? And I understand it now, you know, like now it just, I don't take anything for granted. If I wouldn't probably been raped at six years old, I wouldn't have the daughter that I have right now. I wouldn't Mm -hmm. have been the mother who I am right now. So yes, maybe a tough lesson to kind of be a good mother, but fuck it. If that's what it takes, you know, I said, God put me through, I will go through everything a million times. Just don't let anything happen to my daughter. Like if I let me go through it, don't let anything happen to her. And thank God knock on wood till this day. It's just been a blessing. Darlene, can you tell us about the charity that you're involved with and like how people can donate? So this organization is, you know, they do donations. I was able to, with the government, been able to get them a, uh, 
it's, it's really hard to do things in Latin America. I don't know if you guys understand, but it's really yeah. hard to get the government involved and all that. So I was able to help them make him an, a, an organization that I'm very proud of. I was able to accomplish that. And now they just really, truly receive just donations, you know, because these girls don't have food. They don't, you know, the donations that they receive is just to literally um, have them in that, in that, in this building, in this house, you know, in this compound until they have their kids. And then here you go, there's your kid, you know, that unfortunately there is no abortion, you know, I mean, I don't want to be unsensitive for other people, but I think that, you know, people should have their own rights to what they do with A their choice. body, especially yeah. children. So, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So you'll send us that, the link, um, yes. and the name of it again is called? Centro uh, de Adolescentes de Villa Maria del Triunfo. It's so long. <laughs> and what does that mean? It's a Centro de Adolescentes. It's a center of teenagers. I'm trying to translate. Centro de Adolescentes. Uh, and the, the name of the, the place where is Maria, Maria, blah, blah, blah. Centro de Adolescentes Maria Maria del Triunfo. So that's the area. So it's just <laughs> a center of teen of save of Denver. So it's just it's a very simple name. It sounds very yeah. freaking it's elaborate. Easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. That's a, you know, it's a very tough subject and I'm, I'm happy that you shared with us. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, yeah, thank you. Know, you. I, I appreciate it too. If there's anything Bodacious Minds can help you promote and help you with your charities, please let us know and we'd love to, to have I you back on the show. That. Thank yeah. you so much. I definitely appreciate it. And you guys are so beautiful. I appreciate the having me as a as a guest. Thank and you. Thank you too also, <laughs> Yvette, you. for having me on the show. And well, you're very welcome, Stephanie. I'm really glad I got to talk to you, Darlene. Also, just yeah. it, it was quite inspiring for me, I guess, you know, to oh, thank be you. put in front of three, you know, us two two women, us three women to be able to relate to one another and yeah. know that like, we're not alone in the support and everything you know, is and all it, the beautiful things can still happen. And you know yeah. what, Stephanie is like what I, when, when I emailed you, I said, you'll be surprised the beauty that comes out of this. Well, it's again, like sometimes our bad things turn into good. So, you know, I'm glad that I was with you guys and we also relate on something and you form a sisterhood, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you very much because it was, yeah. you know, there are no coincidences. So this, no, this whole one was supposed to happen. I suppose I was like, ah, yeah. oh, fuck, this is going to be a hard one. <laughs> yeah. fuck. But it was really enlightening though, just because, you know, all the challenges that you conquered, everything that you've been through. Um, and you've come out, you've come out on top the light at the end of the tunnel is possible, you know? And I think that's what we hope to portray and, and share with people is always look for the light. There's nothing you can't survive. I'll tell you that. That's why my husband <laughs> calls me Kuka because he says like cockroaches. That's the one thing that survives at the end of the world. So he's on the Kuka. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a cucaracha. That's so funny. Cucaracha. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that's it for the show. Thank you to Darlene again for being our guest on Bodacious Minds. And thank you. Um, we will look forward to having you back, Darlene. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. Bye, Darlene. Bye. Bye. On the next episode of Bodacious Minds, join me and my guest host, Dina Carmen as we talk with former pro football player Melvin Fowler, center for the Cleveland Browns, Buffalo Bills, and other teams about life after football and healthy living. Thanks for listening and thank you to my guest co-host Stephanie Baclan and our guest Darlene Mahoney. Bodacious Minds is a production of Electrocast Media. Our executive producers are Mark Netter and Peter Rafelson. Our editor is Kyle McCarthy. I'm your host and producer Yvette Lopez. If you liked our show, please subscribe and give us a rating wherever you enjoy podcasts. And always remember, be smart, be sexy, own it. Tricky